Excuse me. <clears throat> That's about all I can do. <clears throat> Kidding, there's the sermon. <laughs> <laughs> Will you pray with me, please? <laughs> Holy God, I thank you for using me this day. Help me to lift my voice to the sentiment of your will so that we will hear your desire in all that is spoken today. Therefore, allow my words to be a reflection of your love. And may those who hear, hear nothing but your love. In the holy name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. <clears throat> Amen. Sometimes you hear something, and no matter how often you have heard it, you revel in hearing it again. Like the song we just heard, total praise is one of those things. I don't care how many times we sing it, it will always be an incredibly moving song. The way it builds, the crescendos, the words, all those amens. It has emotion at every level and therefore makes it moving and memorable. There are a lot of songs like that, <clears throat> ones we could play over and over and never get tired of them. There are CDs in my player at home that I haven't switched out in two or more years. And I actually went, on, went and turned them on right after writing that sentence and listened to them again. There are books we reread, re movies we watch again, Netflix miniseries we binge watch more than once, and then hopefully there are scriptures we could never tire of hearing or reading. A lot of the Psalms may be like this for us. Psalm 23, <clears throat> even if we can't remember the whole thing, the, the first and last line are pretty good. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. One of my favorites is Psalm 4610. Be still and know that I am God. Some of the words of the prophets are worth hearing more than once. Jeremiah 2911. For this is what the Lord says. I know the plans I have for you. Plans to give you hope and a future. And I certainly hope there are words of Jesus we could listen to every day. All day. I have come that you may have life and have it in abundance. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God and trust in me. I will not leave you orphaned. I will come for you. Of course, somebody will lift it up tonight at the Super Bowl. For God so loved the world, he gave his only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. I would say those are some good ones. Perhaps you have some of your own favorites. But like Psalm 23, sometimes we only remember a phrase or two. And that's fine, perfectly fine, perfectly helpful, even recommended. John 10.10, 10, John 3.16, Psalm 46.10, one verse. But we can also remember some longer ones. We do <clears throat> the Lord's Prayer, which is spelled out for us in both the Gospels of Matthew and Luke. It's the prayer in Matthew that is probably more familiar to us. It's the one most of us grew up with, the one we'll say later at the altar table. But Luke still gives us the Lord's Prayer. 
it's just that it is, it is shorter than Matthew's version. A couple of the intermediate phrases have been left out. <clears throat> it's the same prayer, just fewer words. You don't always need a lot of words to pray. And then there are the Beatitudes. I think most of us can recognize them when we start to read them. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall be shown mercy. There are nine of them. But if I were to wager right now and give us a quiz, I would bet that our bell curve for grading would be very skewed toward not getting too many rights. In fact, I'm sure I would be hard pressed to list them in their entirety, all nine of them, if suddenly the question was sprung on me. But that is only if we are grading using Matthew's version. For just like the Lord's Prayer, Matthew, once again, uses more words than Luke. Luke only lists four Beatitudes, not nine. Blessed are the poor. Blessed are the hungry. Blessed are those who weep. And blessed are those who are excluded and hated. And then instead of more beatitudes, more blesseds, Luke then gives us a bunch of woes. We didn't read them this morning, but right after them is, are four more wo or four woes that directly contradict the blesseds that were just said. Woe to the rich, it says, to, to counteract blessed are the poor. Woe to those who are well fed, it says, to contradict blessed are the hungry. Woe to those who laugh and do not mourn, and woe to those who are exalted and not hated. Now, for some Bible literalists, <clears throat> meaning people who insist that every single word in all, every, in all of the Bible must agree with every other word, regardless of what it actually says, this drives them crazy. That's how you can spot one, by the way. <laughs> and frankly, I love, I love them. But I also love it when that happens. For they will chase themselves in circles until exhausted, never reconciling their own point. The point for us is not insisting by some magical way they are not different. But why did Matthew and Luke remember them differently? And then, why do we remember them differently? And then, why do we normally opt for Matthew over Luke? <clears throat> now, we have mentioned several times before how different accounts of something do not necessarily negate one another or need to be re reconciled to one another, but that how they actually enhance one another. If you remember my oft-told story about going to the beach as a child, I don't remember what year it was, I don't remember how old I was, what I do remember is I got a terrible sunburn and I was left out of going to the beach because I had to stay in the unair conditioned hotel room every day. And how my brothers and sisters couldn't care less about telling that part of the story, they got to go to the beach every day. They don't include the part about how I suffered enormously <laughs> and was forgotten. Which sounds actually a lot like me, blessed are those who are excluded. <laughs> Take that family of mine if you're watching. <laughs> They're not. Same trip to the beach, same people at the beach, different stories. And they do not negate one another. They give you two different vantage points 
to see how the story unfolds. That's all. And so it is with the gospel writers. In fact, that is why the four gospels were included. They each play a part in rounding out the entire story of Jesus for us and what Jesus meant to all people, not just one group. So what makes Luke's version of the Beatitudes just as memorable as Matthew's? Well, listen to them again and think about them as we're used to hearing them. Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who hunger now, for you will be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you, exclude you, insult and slander you because of me. Rejoice and leap for joy, for great is your reward in heaven. They sound somewhat familiar, right? But here are the woes. But woe to you who are rich now. For you have already, already received your comfort. Woe to you who are well fed now, for you will go hungry. Woe to you who laugh now, for you will mourn and weep. And woe to you when everybody speaks well of you, for that is how their ancestors treated false prophets. No wonder we like Matthew's version better, right? I mean, Matthew sets out and blesses us nine different times. Luke only does it four and then curses us in four, actually contradicting what the blessings were for to begin with. How does that even make sense? Was he suffering sun poison when he wrote this like I was, that fateful trip to the beach, completely delirious? No, I don't think so. Luke was simply doing exactly what Luke always did. He was telling us the story of Jesus while emphasizing the condition of the human heart and how it is the condition of our hearts that make life worth living and who we are living for. Whether we are the ones producing good fruits, helping usher in the kingdom of God, or not. Whether we are the ones destined to dwell forever in the house of the Lord, or not. I mean, what Luke is not saying here is that the poor are somehow better blessed than the rich. Rich people love to say that, by the way. Or that the hungry should feel better blessed than others. Or that those who weep and mourn should just get over it and find that elusive joy that is supposed to come to us in the morning. I mean, think about it. What would it be like if all of those people's roles were suddenly reversed. Wouldn't they then become the ones Jesus says woe to? And vice versa? The rich are the poor, the poor are the rich? That doesn't make sense. Obviously, there are issues of compassion and justice here. But Luke is going beyond that. For Jesus went beyond that. Because issues of compassion and justice always start first in our hearts. For it, it is a hardened heart that makes the world a hard place to live in. The thing to remember about these words of Jesus 
is not that he's condemning all these woeful people to an, to an eternity in hell. He is encouraging them to look deep within themselves and soften their hearts. To warn us how dangerous it is for us in becoming too self-satisfied and self-assured and self-righteous, causing us to think and claim that all we have earned, all of our wonderful blessings, we got them because we deserve them. We worked for them. And if others are suffering, well, they should work a little harder. If you're poor, get a job. If you're hungry, get a job. If you are weeping, stop it. Carry on. And if it turns out that people hate you and exclude you, well, why don't, why don't you stop acting like the way you are and start acting like the rest of us? Stop flaunting your lifestyle in front of everybody and shoving it down our throats. These are the conditions of the heart that Jesus simply tells us that is not the way. For when you build a wall between yourself and others and call that wall your rightful blessings, that's a pretty woeful way to live. Ask a rich person who suddenly loses all their riches in the marketplace. I mean, they jump out of buildings and shoot themselves. They don't know what to do. Or those who skip the banquet tables because they gained an ounce yesterday. They would have no idea what it means to actually be hungry and hope for that smallest scrap falling from one of those tables. Ask those who have insulated themselves from all hardship, even death. They're left in lonely terror when death ultimately crosses their threshold. And finally, when someone who has, who has never been hated or excluded a day in their lives, no fault of their own, they just haven't been that way, if they ever feel that sting for the first time, unfortunately, one of the most common reactions is that they become more hateful than those reviling them, thus perpetuating that vicious cycle that many of us know all too well. These are the woes Jesus speaks of. The conditions of our hearts that Jesus would like for us to change. For they are hearts that ultimately belong to God. This is the great reversal that Jesus brought into the world to know what it is like to be counted among the blessed, even when you have n absolutely nothing to give, but everything need you need to receive. To be counted as children of God, not because you are strong and can get your way, but because you are gentle and meek and, and opt to stay behind with those who suffer and do not gain anything in this world. Not the self-made man or woman who has pulled them up by their own bootstraps. But those who have no boots to walk in. And ask us to go buy them those shoes they need. Because they need them to go to the job they just got. And to plant yourself firmly with those who are ridiculed, hated, and excluded held up as born sinners and examples of what not to be if you want to be a good Christian. But rather be blessed because you know that to actually follow Christ, you allow him to pull you up. You allow him to pull you up 
onto the same cross we raised him up on. You follow him because you know that it is only him who shows us the blessedness of everyone in this world. You know that part about raising up on the cross? There's a lot of other people who like to skip that. The sticks and stones of Lent and Good Friday, preferring only to jump straight ahead to Easter, the victory of God over all things. My friends, do not skip the stories in your lives that are hard to remember simply because they are hard to take. Read them again. Read the Gospels again. And meet the real Jesus there again. For these are the stories that will lead us into that house of God where we can dwell forever and ever. Will you pray with me, please? <clears throat> Holy God, it is with great humbleness and thankfulness that we bow down before you today and say thank you for all you have done for us. Thank you for the meal we did have this morning. Thank you for the abundance in our lives that sometimes allow us to willingly skip a meal. That list goes on and on, but you know what you have given us far more than we do. Our prayer this morning is that you allow us to see your great works in the lives of the ones we sometimes thank you only because we are not like them. Hear our new prayer that we may know exactly what it is to be like them. For in your heart, there is no us and them, but only your beloved children, whom you have plans to prosper and give hope to us all. These are the things we pray in the name of the one who lived with us through them. Your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, my friends, let us take a moment of silence and allow these words <clears throat> to work themselves within us. Amen.